We are finally ready to tackle language models. At its core, language modeling is about understanding the sequential nature of language, trying to predict what comes next based on what's come before. Imagine reading an incomplete sentence and trying to guess the next word. This is precisely what a language model does. We input a sequence of tokens into the model, and the model then uses its internal knowledge, derived from training on large amounts of data, to predict the most likely subsequent token. Let's now look at how we represent tokens in a language model. A token can be a character, an entire word, or even part of a word. When tokens are represented as individual characters, the model processes text letter by letter. On the other hand, word-level tokenization breaks down text into individual words. This is less granular, but can capture relationships between words more effectively. A middle ground between character and word tokenization is subword tokenization. Here, common words get a slot in the vocabulary, but more complex or less common words can be broken down into smaller pieces. This is what most modern language models use. Once we have determined the tokens of our language model, we can arrange them in a fixed order vocabulary so that we can assign each token its unique index. These indices can be converted into input features in many ways. We would not want to feed them directly into the model, as the vocabulary order doesn't capture any useful semantic relationship. Instead, we can one-hot encode the tokens. Imagine a vocabulary with 10,000 words. Each word would be represented by a vector with 10,000 elements. All would be zeros except the element corresponding to the index of the word in the vocabulary. The advantage of one-hot encoding is that it avoids assumptions about the relative importance of words and allows the model to learn the relationship between words during training. The issue with one-hot encoding is that it doesn't scale well to very large vocabularies. Take the English vocabulary, we have over 100,000 words, which means that to represent a single word, we would need a vector with 100,000 words elements. And now think of a very long sequence and that would take a lot of space and a lot of computational power. To solve this dimensionality issue, we use embeddings. An embedding layer simply projects the one hot encoded tokens into a vector with fewer dimensions. These new embeddings are like more dense versions of tokens. In practical terms, the embedding layer is just another linear layer with a weight matrix. It is one of the parameters the model will learn to optimize during training. The idea is that after training, words that are related or similar end up closer together in this compressed space. When you look at a graph, you'll see these word vectors huddle close to each other if they share meaning or context. Putting all pieces together, our language model takes in a sequence of tokens, which are then one hot encoded and projected into embeddings. The embeddings are fed into one or more recurrent layers. A last linear layer is added to the model to map the high dimensional representations learned by the recurrent layer into our vocabulary space. The output of the model after processing the sequence is a vector of logits that we can then pass through a softmax activation. This output configuration should look familiar, as it's basically the same we used for classification tasks where we are predicting the probability that a certain input belongs to a certain category, except here we are predicting the probability of each possible next word in the dictionary to finish off the input sequence. We'll now look at how to train a language model so that it can recognize patterns in language and thus be able to predict the next word correctly. We first need to generate our training set. 
say from all the sentences in a book. As the sentences in the book are not labeled, we refer to this process as self-supervised learning. This involves pairing a segment of text as input with the corresponding next segment as the target. For instance, from a sentence like the cat sat on the mat, we may use the cat sat on the as the input and cat sat on the mat as the target. During training, we process one batch at a time. Let's assume a batch with two sentences. First off, we initialize the hidden states for each item in the batch to zeros. Then we feed the first word of each sentence in the batch into the network, keeping track of the hidden state for the next word. We compute the loss looking at the next token in the target output. We then continue by feeding the next token into the sequence. After processing all sentences in the batch, we compute the loss across all batches and perform backpropagation to adjust the network parameters and move to the next batch. Now the exciting part. We've trained a language model and we'll see how to actually use it to generate text. We begin by inputting an initial word or phrase. This is our seed for text generation. The model then looks at this input to predict the next token. The predicted word is then fed back into the model as the next input. The model then uses this new input to predict yet another word or character. This process creates a feedback loop, allowing the model to generate continuous sequences of text, word by word or character by character. Now, you might think that we always pick the word with the highest probability as the next word. This is called greedy approach. But if we did that, our outputs would become very predictable and often repetitive. Instead, we want our model to be creative and generate diverse outputs. One way to add diversity is to use top K sampling. Here, instead of always choosing the top prediction, the model considers the top k predictions and chooses randomly from among them. This ensures a balance between predictability and randomness. Alternatively, one could use the top p sampling strategy. Here, we sample from the top predictions whose combined probability does not exceed the value p. Another parameter used is the temperature, which directly impacts the probability distribution of the upcoming token. Think of it as tweaking the sharpness of this distribution. When the temperature is set to a value less than one, the softmax probability distribution becomes sharp. What this means is when selecting the next word, the model will more often lean towards the highest probability word it recognized during training, resulting in more predictable and consistent output. On the other hand, a higher temperature spreads the probability distribution, making it flatter. Instead of a sharp peak, you'd see the probability more evenly distributed across several tokens. This makes the model's output more random, potentially infusing the generated text with greater creativity and variability. By fine-tuning the balance between top P sampling and temperature, we can get a wide range of outputs from a language model, maybe something more precise and coherent, or something more novel and creative. The next episode is a very exciting one. We'll take everything we've learned, put it together and train our first language model. Don't forget to check out the description for more information and links to the topics that we discussed in this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified of the upcoming videos. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.